Imagine a movie without characters, story, or spoken dialogue. There's an entire subgenre of these very films. They're sometimes given the more vague label of abstract, avant-garde, experimental, or non-narrative, which they arguably are. Some may even refer to them in jest as music videos, screensavers, or test footage for showcasing the latest in high-definition technology. To be honest, I'm not even sure how to directly address these types of films, but I find them to be the most refreshing and contemplative for allowing the viewer the chance to take them in in a quiet manner. For the purposes of this video, I'll call them abstract visual poems, but call them what you like. These types of films have been around for quite some time. The first example that comes to mind can be seen in 1921's Manhattan, directed by Charles Sheeler and photographed by Paul Strand. This 10-minute film showcases footage from different parts of New York City, from the Staten Island Ferry to a sunset scene from a skyscraper. There are title cards describing the city, and this may label it as a documentary, but Manhattan has often been referred to as an early example of avant-garde filmmaking. This format of filmmaking would carry on in the genre of City Symphonies, with such follow-ups as Berlin, Symphony of a Great City in 1927, and Skyscraper Symphony in 1929. Many more of these films would follow as the years went on, but they were usually experimental shorts that wouldn't garner a larger audience as a feature film. This would change, however, with director Godfrey Reggio. In the 1970s, Reggio had been very much involved with media campaigns with the Institute for Regional Education, to push issues on privacy and behavior-controlling technology. Working alongside the American Civil Liberties Union, he would craft everything from horrific billboards of human eyes to provocative television commercials alongside cinematographer Ron Frick. One campaign was successful enough to remove Ritalin from New Mexico schools as a means of curbing behavior problems. But when the ACLU cut off funding when the campaign was completed, the Institute only had a budget of $40,000 for a project. Reggio wasn't sure what to do with such an amount, but Frick knew what to do. Make a movie. Both Reggio and Frick started their movie project in 1975. There was no script, just a series of footage from various cities they decided to edit together. It was a scattershot method, as Frick described his decision in What to Record. I just shot anything that I thought would look good on film. Shooting bums as well as buildings didn't matter. It was all the same from my standpoint. I just shot the form of things. Over the next few years, Reggio and Frick would continue to add more footage and experiment with all sorts of camera and editing techniques. They would even go the extra length to get just the right shots, such as the mountain scenes and airplane footage taking many tries to get right, sometimes encompassing weeks of shooting. Eventually, after much tinkering, the film would enter post-production in 1981, with Reggio now editing the film at the Samuel Goldwyn studio. While there, he met director Francis Ford Coppola, who was interested in receiving a private screening of what Reggio had shot. They arranged it, and after the screening, Coppola remarked that this was the type of film he'd been waiting for. And that film was 1982's Koyanis Katsi. Koyanis Katsi, translated from the uto aztecian language of Hopi, means life out of balance. Similar to the likes of Skyscraper Symphony, the film features juxtaposed footage of nature and civilization with accompanying music and no dialogue. Reggio opened up about the whole no dialogue decision and stated the choice was not for lack of the language that these films have no words. It's because from my point of view, our language is in a state of vast humiliation. It no longer describes the world in which we live. The soundtrack by Philip Glass did all the talking. His score is some of the most hypnotic and astounding music I've ever heard in a movie. The opening theme setting the perfect tone of an organ player and a deep droning choir. Even if you've never seen the movie, you may recognize some of the music as Glass's best work, as seen in Zack Snyder's film adaptation of Watchmen, using Glass's somber songs to accompany Dr. Manhattan's montage of his life. Despite seeming so niche, Koyanis Katsi has had an impact on pop culture. The Simpsons would directly parody the film, where the murderous cartoon characters of Itchy and Scratchy would appear in a parody movie called Koyanis Scratchy, Death Out of Balance. The success of Koyanis Katsi led to sequels, such as 1988's Poa Quatsi, Life in Transformation, and 2002's Nakoi Quatsi, Life as War. 
These three films are better known as the Katsi Trilogy, all of them directed by Reggio and scored by Philip Glass. Ron Frick would also move on to directing his own trilogy of abstract visual poems with 1985's Kronos, 1992's Baraka, and 2011's Samsara. Frick's trilogy is worth noting as similar construction to the Katsi films, but with less of a contemplative nature on juxtaposition and more or less a whimsical approach to the world's beauty. Samsara, in particular, is Frick's most gorgeous of masterpieces for his choices in colorful and mesmerizing footage from around the globe. There may be a scoffing from such a film as Koyanis Katsi that it seems too subtle or overly simple on the surface, as though there's some deeper meaning that's too aloof in its presentation. Now sure, I could dig deep into Koyanis Katsi's many visual subtexts of the vast canyons representing centuries behind us, or I could observe the controversial choice of ending the film with the 1962 explosion of the first Atlas Centaur as a display where human life may be headed next. I could even dissect the meaning within the music, the way the lyrics translate to such prophecies as, near the day of purification there will be cobwebs spun back and forth in the sky. But in truth, these films are not as intimidating as they may appear, that I don't feel the need to make such a high level of analysis. They are more open to interpretation, giving off a therapeutic effect in trying to take everything in as the film moseys from one location to another. But if you need something more concrete, Reggio did open up about the film's reflective nature, stating that these films have never been about the effect of technology, of industry on people. Politics, education, things of the financial structure, the nation-state structure, language, the culture, religion, all of that exists within the host of technology. So it's not the effect of, it's that everything exists within technology. It's not that we use technology, we live technology. Technology has become as ubiquitous as the air we breathe. Koyanis Katsi, similar to its sequels and spin-offs, is a meditative film that is certainly not going to be for everyone as an atmospheric experience, but in its own way of letting the music whisk us away in its swirling juxtaposition of nature, technology, and humanity, you may just see something profound and emotional within this experiment. When I try to recommend films, I often like to point out certain elements to look for and take note of as they make the experience all the more enriching, but with Koyanis Katsi, all I can really tell you is to let the film just play and see what it conjures within the mind. Thanks for watching this video. If you'd like to see a particular video essay in the future, consider donating to my Patreon where I will be taking requests through there. Again, thank you for watching.